Welcome to this PRL on double-stranded DNA damage and repair mechanisms. We'll look at the steps of non-homologous end joining and of homologous recombination. I'll point out how clinical cancer predisposition syndromes relate to inherited deficits and specific DNA repair proteins in each of these pathways. However, the objective of this PRL is not to teach those syndromes in depth, so you will need to use other resources to learn more about them. DNA is represented in the same manner throughout this PRL. The dark teal line combined with the light green boxes represents the sugar phosphate backbone. Specifically, the light green boxes represent the sugar molecules. The three prime end is represented by the arrow head, while the five prime end is represented by the arrow tail. The letters represent the bases. The double helix is ignored for the sake of simplicity. First, let's start with an overview of double-stranded breaks. When both strands of the DNA double helix break within the same region, this is termed a double-stranded break. Double-stranded breaks are very common within the cell and can potentially lead to a hazardous condition because the genome may rearrange if the broken strands are not properly reunited and joined, thus resulting in genomic instability. There are different pathways to repair double-stranded breaks, the most important of which are non-homologous end joining and homologous recombination. The mechanism used for repair depends on when in the cell cycle the double-stranded break occurs. Homologous recombination requires a homologous chromosome to use as a template, so homologous recombination occurs primarily in late S phase or in G2 phase. It is during these times, following DNA replication but preceding cell division, that a sister chromosome is available to serve as a template. Conversely, non-homologous end joining recognizes and re-ligates free DNA ends but does not rely on the presence of a template. Therefore, non-homologous end joining is most likely to occur during G0, G1, and early S phase, although it can occur during any time of the cell cycle. It is the double-stranded repair mechanism that is most often employed by the cell. Before we look at the steps of each type of repair, let's consider the types of damage that activate the double-stranded repair pathways. Oxidative damage is a major cause of double-stranded breakage. Oxidative damage may result from reactive oxygen species that are produced during normal endogenous processes, including oxidative respiration and the oxidative burst of phagocytic immune cells. Additionally, many exogenous sources produce reactive oxygen species, including the natural ionizing radiation of our environment and chemical mutagens. Free radicals can react with DNA to cause a break. If breaks occur within both phosphate backbones in close proximity, a double-stranded break may arise. Another cause of double-stranded breaks, which is not necessary to memorize but which is interesting, is due to type 2 topoisomerase. Type 2 topoisomerase purposely cuts both DNA strands in order to untangle DNA supercoils, but may fail to repair this break. As a side note, the chemotherapeutic agent etoposide is designed to take advantage of this natural process and to prevent type 2 topoisomerase from repairing the breaks that it causes, thus resulting in the death of rapidly dividing cells. We'll first look at non-homologous end joining in detail since it is the more common and the simpler process of the main double-stranded DNA repair mechanisms. The majority of double-stranded break repair occurs by non-homologous end joining and it can occur at any point within the cell cycle. Non-homologous end joining is not considered a high fidelity process. Because a template is not required for repair, the mechanism is prone to error and to the introduction of mutations. Deletions, in particular, often result, and we'll take a closer look at how those occur. Translocations may result if non-matching DNA ends are ligated together. Non-homologous end joining brings together free strands of DNA and re-ligates them. There are three main steps to this process. First, Q70, Q80 heterodimer recognizes and binds to the broken ends of the DNA strands. Once bound, the Q70, Q80 heterodimer recruits the DNA PKCS complex, which stands for DNA-dependent protein kinase catalytic subunit. DNA PKCS is a kinase which serves to synapse the DNA ends by phosphorylating specific targets, which in turn recruit several proteins, including Artemis and DNA ligase. Let's look at how this process can result in a deletion. Artemis is a nuclease that processes the DNA ends for rejoining. 
If the broken DNA has an overhang, Artemis cleaves this overhang. This process results in a loss of genetic material. Once the DNA ends are joined, DNA ligase forms the phosphodiester bond. Let's turn now to the details of homologous recombination. Because homologous recombination requires an identical or nearly identical sequence as a template to repair the break, it is considered high fidelity repair. Recall that homologous recombination occurs during late S phase and throughout G2 when a homologous chromosome is available to serve as a template following DNA replication. One cause of double-stranded breaks that specifically occurs during the process of DNA replication is called fork collapse. When DNA replication occurs where two or more DNA lesions are clustered along both strands in close proximity, the strands are prone to breakage because of the stress of replication. Because this breakage occurs near the replication fork, it is called fork collapse. Let's look now at the steps of homologous recombination. Along the way, we'll see where heritable defects lead to cancer predisposition syndromes. First, there are a number of proteins that identify the double-stranded DNA break. Together, they are termed the MRN complex. Let's pause here for a clinical correlation. An important protein to recognize within the MRN complex is NBS1. When NBS1 is mutated because of a heritable defect, Nijmegen breakage syndrome results. Without a functional NBS1 protein, the double-stranded break is not recognized. These patients are extremely sensitive to ionizing radi radiation and are at particular risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, among other cancers. Overall, patients with Nijmegen breakage syndrome are 50 times more likely to develop cancer than people without this heritable protein defect. These patients also have stunted growth, intellectual disability, a distinctive craniofacial appearance, and immunodeficiency. Returning to the mechanism, once the MRN complex has sensed the DNA damage, a signal must be transduced to recruit the necessary repair proteins. There are a number of proteins that transduce this signal, but two to be familiar with are CHECK2 and ATM. Let's look at the cancer predisposition syndromes associated with hereditary defects in these proteins. CHECK2 is a tumor suppressor protein that prevents mitotic division in the case of a double-stranded break. CHECK2 also serves to stabilize P53, which leads to the arrest of the cell in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. Hereditary mutations in either CHECK2 or P53 result in Lee-Fraumeni syndrome, an autosomal dominant cancer predisposition syndrome. Because of the central role of P53, individuals with Lee-Fraumeni syndrome are at high risk of developing multiple cancers from a young age. The failure of CHECK2 or of P53 to halt the cell cycle allows for a cell with DNA damage to replicate. Patients with Lee Frau Mini syndrome have a 50% risk of developing cancer by age 30 and a 90% risk by age 60. The most common tumors associated with Lee Frau Mini syndrome are soft tissue sarcomas, osteosarcoma, brain tumors, breast cancer, leukemia, and adrenal cortical carcinoma. ATM is a serine threonine kinase that phosphorylates several targets, most of which are tumor suppressors, including CHECK2 and P53. When there is a hereditary mutation of the ATM gene, the ATM protein fails to recognize double-stranded breaks and recruit the necessary tumor suppressors. This failure results in the autosomal recessive cancer predisposition syndrome known as ataxia telangiectasia. In fact, ATM stands for ataxia telangiectasia mutated kinase. Cells with defective ATM have particular impairment with repairing DNA damage caused by ionizing radiation. These patients are especially prone to lymphomas and leukemias. These patients also demonstrate progressive ataxia, which is muscle incoordination that results in gait abnormalities and eventually results in the need for a wheel wheelchair by late childhood, telangiectasias, which are clusters of enlarged blood vessels seen on the skin and in the eyes, and immunodeficiency. Returning to the mechanism of homologous recombination, the MRN complex now processes the ends of the broken DNA strands to generate three prime single-stranded overhangs of several hundred base pairs, though only a few base pairs are shown here, on either side of the break. 
The protein BRCA1 has many functions, one of which is to form a complex with PAL2 and BRCA2, which in turn recruits the protein RAD51 to the site of damage. BRCA2 loads RAD51 onto a broken strand, which allows for strand invasion, the process by which one of the three prime single-stranded tails invades into the homologous region of the double-stranded template. The three prime end serves as a primer for synthesis of one strand of the broken DNA. The other strand is later synthesized using the new strand as its template, the process of which is not shown here. As you can see, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 proteins are central to homologous recombination. In hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, a patient has a germline defect in either the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 gene which code for these proteins. Women with this autosomal dominant condition have a significant lifetime risk for the development of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Men with a BRCA2 mutation have an elevated risk of prostate and breast cancers. We'll note one final rare but important cancer predisposition syndrome whose exact mechanism is still under active investigation. Patients with Bloom syndrome have an inherited mutation resulting in a mutated DNA helicase. This helicase is involved in double-stranded break repair and prevents excessive crossing over. Failure of this helicase results in a huge increase in sister chromatid exchange, resulting in genomic instability. This autosomal recessive condition predisposes patients to epithelial tumors, leukemias, lymphomas, and certain pediatric cancers. Patients also have impaired growth, sun sensitivity, immunodeficiency, and a characteristic malar rash. This concludes the PRL on double-stranded DNA repair mechanisms. We covered non-homologous end joining and homologous recombination. The single-stranded repair mechanisms are covered in a separate PRL.